Good morning, everyone. I'm, my name is Dorian Arnold. I'm from Emory University. I'm chairing the next session. It is my honor and my pleasure to be here to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Pete Beckman. Dr. Beckman is the co-director of the Northwestern Argonne Institute for Science and Engineering. For the past 25 years, he's been conducting very pioneering research in software and hardware architectures for ex extreme scale computing systems. He's the ECP project lead for Argonne's operating systems and runtime team. He's the founder and leader of the Waggle project for smart sensors and edge computing that is used by the Array of Things project. In his copious spare time, because he's not doing enough research, he, his favorite hobbies are woodworking. He enjoys recording gospel choirs in northern Ghana, touring the wilderness by canoe or backpacking, and doing bicycle touring. His long, longest bicycle tour was 2,700 miles. Um, and if he weren't a computer scientist, he would either be a wooden furniture crafter or a wilderness trekking guide. So with that, please help me to welcome Dr. Pete Beckman. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure being here, and thank you for the invitation. Uh, thanks, for, Dorian, for uh, asking us for other facts about our life that are not normally on a CV. Um, so I'm gonna be talking about uh, some, some interesting places where high-performance computing is headed, where it's going. And uh, um, this is not... Uh, uh, the biggest and largest machines, but it is interconnected in a way I hope that uh, uh, you'll see. The work that uh, I'll be talking about today uh, is done primarily by myself, uh, Nicola Ferrier, uh, Charlie Catlett, Rajesh Sankaran. Uh, all, four of the, all four of us are here at Supercomputing, so please uh, stop by and ask questions. Uh, if you can't reach me after the talk, uh, that would be fine to ask either of those folks uh, about what's happening. So most of us, when we think about supercomputers, we also sort of think about super instruments, you know, billion dollar instruments, uh, these very large things either put into space or uh, at uh, facilities, and they generate tremendous amounts of data. And there will be an upgrade to Argonne's uh, uh, advanced light source that generates, you know, just a, a flood of data that we'll be putting in new fiber to get that data over to the supercomputer. And these are the kinds of things that supercomputers you know, live for. They love being able to crunch on these, on these styles of data. And we build systems like Summit, I'm sure you've heard of at Oak Ridge. Uh, this is the machine at Argonne. And you know, for, for decades, this has been the place where supercomputing lives. B super large machines working on extremely large data sets from, uh, uh, from instruments and doing simulation and modeling for that next generation. What can we do? What does that, uh, what does combustion look like? What uh, uh, does the climate look like? And making forecasts. But I'm gonna start by saying there's another side, the opposite end of that spectrum, are the kinds of things that you might deploy uh, locally. And so, uh, about five years ago, someone at Argonne came to us and they had an interesting problem. They said, look, I have a camera that is a hyperspectral camera and I'd like to deploy it out at a farm field. And uh, uh, it generates a lot of data and uh, it uses uh, many different bands of light in order to understand what's happening at, the, on, at plants. And our hypothesis is that we can detect exactly when plants are doing photosynthesis by analyzing the, the actual wavelengths that we're getting back reflected from light. And so this sounded very cool. Uh, and we found out why they really wanted to come talk to the computer scientists is they wanted to deploy this and they didn't, and the only software they had was Windows software and they wanted to run on Linux. And it's like, well, you know, as a computer scientist, that isn't really what I'm here for. Um, but, but the problem was fan very fascinating. And as we got further into trying to understand what these kinds of devices can do, we realized that the real problem was a data problem. So uh, this is a classic uh, uh, hyperspectral camera. You can buy one of these kind of cameras. Uh, and you can see that it generates 
about five gigabytes per image. Now, these kind of images are not something that you want to do a JPEG compression on because the signal is in all of those planes, all of those layers of data. And it turns out if you wanted to do something like take a picture every five minutes so that you can watch photosynthesis across the day on a very long day, like in June, you would need a terabyte a day. So that's not a supercomputer size problem, but it means that there's really no way I can move all of that data off the node over a network when, it's, when we put hundreds of these or more out in an in a, uh, ecosystem. So it means that we have to start putting a parallel computer right there where the data is generated. Now, physicists have been doing this for quite some time, and this is a physics experiment uh, in Antarctica. It's very cool. It's called Ice Cube, of course, uh, uh, in Antarctica. And there are more than 5,000 sensors drilled down into the ice, and they're looking for neutrinos and other things, and they're getting data from those 5,000 sensors and pulling it up. And the problem they have is very similar. They have these 5,000 sensors. They generate about a terabyte a day, just like with the hyperspectral camera. But of course, you can't take a terabyte of day and get it from Antarctica to supercomputers in the United States. So you have to bring the computing to the device. And in this case, they have a 400-core Linux cluster in that big building there in Antarctica, right? I guess it's the coldest cluster right there, right? And then they ship the remaining, after the first bit of processing, up to University of Wisconsin. There's Condor cluster, and they, and they work on the data. And so this notion of edge computing, that out on the edge you can see all kinds of things you can't see from the center, right? Big undreamed of things, that data that comes in, and they see them first. And you know, it wasn't really until about two or three years ago that this, even this word edge computing came into being. And it's because this notion that we have so much data being generated there that we need to move parallel computation there is fairly new. But the real modification, the real disruption is that we now have machine learning to actually make progress on that computation out on the edge. So, Several years ago, we had started down this path, again, starting with a farm in Illinois, uh, to say, what kinds of sensors are out on the edge, and how would we process that data? What would that data look like? And we realized that there becomes, with machine learning, there becomes this very interesting loop, this, this uh, iterative uh, computational cycle, where out on the edge, so, right here where the data is generated, that data has to be reduced. And you need some sort of machine learning component to reduce the data. And that machine learning component is a model, right? So let's say you've done deep learning, you've done other forms of, of uh, machine learning. You have some model. You send that reduced compressed data, not the entire terabyte a, uh, a day or any of that. And then the supercomputer retrains on sample data over time generates a new model, and that new model goes back. So there is this, this process by which we do machine learning out on the edge. We do inference. We do lightweight learning. We send that data back to the cloud that's processed. We also send samples, and then we improve, and we go back. And so this is really the new place for where essentially high-performance computing gets linked all the way back to the edge. Now, some folks might ask, okay, wait, wait. Um, you know, let's just get a great big, you know, improve your networking, bring it back to the data center, right? We can just fix this with a good network. Uh, but it isn't that way. There are a lot of reasons why you want to live out on the edge. So the first is, as I mentioned, there's more data than bandwidth. That's, there, there are so many times that, that this is the case. We can't solve that one. But there are other reasons. Latency. There are times when you need to do triggers and make decisions right there at the edge. Um, you know, a good example that you're all familiar with is autonomous vehicles that you've seen uh, and cars. You really want those cars to make decisions about what to do with a bike, bicyclist or a pedestrian right there in the car, right? Not sending data out to California and hoping that the servers finish in time before you need to correct, right? So those decisions have to be made locally. There also are privacy concerns, right? There are many times where you would like to process the data locally and throw out the data except for the signal that's in all of that data. 
Um, there are resilience issues as well. Being able to process and do parallel computing everywhere means that I can take a backhoe and scoop up a fiber optic link, and both sides of the city, both sides of the infrastructure still continue to work because there's edge computation going on there. There's also a, a benefit sometimes to have things that are very low power that are sitting in the background looking for things and uh, 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 not trying to transmit up or not trying to contact the cloud until a trigger, until something is found. So this creates this structure that's very exciting from a computer science perspective where we need to come up with a programming model that lets us go from the standard kinds of computation we do in the facility all the way down to parallel computation that's happening out here. Now there of course will be IoT devices that just report a temperature or humidity or someone entered a room or someone touched a device, sure. But very quickly we move to needing to compute and do machine learning right there on those devices. And the other interesting thing that's happening is as, as you know, mega scale, petascale, exascale uh, computer scientists, we're used to these numbers where we have 10 to the ninth cores. But very interesting is that at the other end of the spectrum, we have 10 to the ninth devices. So there is a sort of scale invariance and in things that we're used to as computer scientists at supercomputing that actually are the same sort of problems except now distributed for edge computing out at the, at the frontier. Now when we started this we, we realized, okay, uh, edge computing can be dangerous and it's because of this design uh, conflict, right? We have this design contradiction which is that I need experimental machine learning algorithms and hardware like the Movidius, like the TX2, uh, all of the, there are, you know, several companies already here and I need to deploy that out on the edge, well, okay, edge, devo edge devices are by definition remotely deployed, which means I don't have a human there to go and plug in a cable and try and make it work. So having a kernel panic, having the standard sort of systems break out at the edge is a problem. Normally, in the, in the world without edge machine learning on the edge, we write very small microprocessor loops, very small kernels with a simple watchdog timer, and that's why things out at the, uh, you know, the IoT world keep working without uh, much trouble, right? But when we start bringing real parallel computation there, parallel computation can be buggy. So to fix that, we borrowed a page from the BlueGene and other supercomputers that we've had in the past, the Intel that we have, uh, from their design, which is what a standard sort of rack controller does, uh, we can do uh, except in the small. So Raj Sankaran, who's a scientist at Argonne, uh, worked with us to design a system, a, a sort of a miniature rack controller, that would let us deploy that with the latest parallel edge uh, computation machine learning hardware so that remotely we had a way to check for heartbeats, automatically choose a different boot media, be able to manage devices remotely. And it also gave us a very, very uh, uh, strict cybersecurity design, which allows us to uh, have those devices only talk to us. There, is no, there are no open ports. There's no way to talk to it. It talks to us, and then we start a, a dialogue. So we built this original platform. We call it Waggle. Um, and uh, uh, the, the dance that bees do when they find uh, uh, a flower, when they find pollen, when they go back to the hive is called the waggle dance. So they're the sort of the first wireless sensors. And so uh, we like that concept of reporting the data back uh, using these edge devices, smart, intelligent uh, devices out at the edge. So we are able to support parallel computation out on these devices, uh, and we can really support disruptive hardware because we've built this little rack controller essentially uh, out at the edge. So we can plug in uh, the latest uh, you know, hardware that needs a little bit of handling because it needs several serial ports or a special USB or needs to be, have its power pulled and re reapplied. We've been doing this in the background for about five years and are now uh, deploying things, and I'll tell you about uh, the projects that we're working on and some of those edge applications for science, uh, not IoT about your, you know, refrigerator or your toaster, but what kind of science apps do we have in that space? 
And one of the things that comes up first as we look at this is um, just a little bit of sci-fi here, right? Which is we've, we, we're all sort of realize the, the remarkable transition that's happening with autonomous vehicles. It's like, wow, that's, that's amazing. They're, they're running parallel computers. They're, they're going to have sophisticated operating systems. There's, there's quite a lot happening. But really, if we think about what's happening with edge computation, right, everything in our environment will be programmable in this way. So how would you program an entire city where there are many thousands of different kinds of edge devices? So, you know, we, we, I was one of those folks who thought when the first, when the first DARPA challenge for autonomous vehicles happened, like, oh, come on, that, that can, you know, you're not going to be able to do that. And I'm just astonished at the progress, right, that machine learning and these uh, kinds of algorithms have made. That same progress is going to happen with all of these devices that are edge, not necessarily cars, but every other kind of device. So now let's look at what kind of devices those are and give examples of that. So one of the biggest projects in this space is led by Charlie Catlett. Uh, it's called the Array of Things. Uh, and it is a project to put sensors that measure air quality and uh, that measure uh, um, uh, activity in the city uh, in the city of Chicago. And it's sponsored by the National Science Foundation. There were, there were, we already have 100 nodes up. There will be about 500 uh, total. And uh, you can see that we have some other pilot cities, uh, Denver, uh, Seattle, Portland, Palo Alto, other places. And they have two cameras, one that's facing up, looking at the clouds, and one that's facing down, looking at the traffic. And then we want to do computer vision and processing. Now, you can see in the picture there uh, at the bottom uh, right-hand corner here, um, let's see if we can get it over here, these are uh, City of Chicago um, electricians about to mount one up on a pole. And uh, when it's mounted up on a pole, uh, you can see it's about uh, 30 feet up on a pole. And this is exactly why we had to design that board for remote management, because asking a grad student to go up the pole and hit the reset button you know, was a safety thing, right? And we were very careful about that at the DOE. So we have to be able to do that remotely. So this is what the node looks like on the inside, but I don't want to focus so much on this particular solution, but more on this notion of being able to do these kinds of things at the edge. So on our particular system, we have a node controller, which is running the standard Linux system and managing everything. We have a an separate edge processing device. And since it's separate, we can give root, we can uh, um, run any kind of crazy hardware we want out there on the edge, and it doesn't impact the ability to run the standard maintenance and uh, encryption and links up. And of course, we have the, the, the management board, the Wagman. And here we have uh, the air quality sensors uh, here, uh, and uh, we call this the brains, and we have a power supply, and the electricians have put up already 100 of these, and as I said, we have a bunch more cities um, going up. And we already are covering with these 100 uh, about uh, uh, 75 or 80 percent of the population with about a two kilometer range. Um, it's quite remarkable. And there are lots of things that scientists want to study. They want to study the lake effect and what's happening. They want to understand transportation safety, uh, pedestrian and bicycle safety. And we're going to go through some of those things. But the real key, again, going back to this concept of what's happening in high-performance computing at the edge, is that there are two components that are getting linked. So we have high-performance training and forecast and future simulation linked to inference and actuation at the edge. And these two are linked together and have to work in tandem together. So this is one of the examples. Uh, this is work that uh, Nicola Ferrier and students did uh, a couple summers ago. And uh, it's looking and trying to uh, understand pedestrian movement using some standard uh, captured images. And then on the right here at the bottom uh, is a standard uh, you know, mask, uh, RCNN, looking at this, in fact, is Lakeshore Drive, which is a, uh, uh, a road in Chicago. And you can see here that's snowy out. Uh, and one of the interesting things about this example here is that you can see from a pedestrian safety perspective that there are people in the road here, and that's not a good thing. 
except then if you look at the original captured image, you see they're wearing yellow green vests and say, oh, those are traffic folks, right? So there's some computer machine learning that has to be able to understand that kind of tagging with what's happening, why are those pedestrians in the street? And this is one example. Uh, we have several more that have already showed up in Chicago, shown up in Chicago, it's quite remarkable. So on the, on the left here is a project that the Illinois Department of Transportation is funding. And they want to use edge computing, intelligence at the edge, to understand what's happening at railroad crossings. How often are emergency vehicles being stuck behind a railroad? They have about a billion dollars to spend on upgrades throughout the infrastructure, but you have to prioritize them. Where should we do those upgrades? Where are paths where trains and at-grade crossings have the most intersection? Where is that the most, where are the largest problems? On the right is some funding from DOE out of the Vehicle Technology Office, and that work is to say, how will, what is the future of traffic and uh, uh, movement around a new uh, extended O'Hare as we look to the future of autonomous vehicles and uh, uh, the shift away from standard taxis to ride sharing, right? So we want to be able to understand that that data, again, from a deployed intelligence at the edge. Another example is flooding. Uh, the city of Chicago has a, has a particular region of the neighbor, uh, neighborhoods called Chatham uh, that has really uh, um, uh, bad flooding areas when, it, when in the springtime when we get several days of rain. Chicago has what is called a combined system for stormwater. Uh, combined means that the stormwater is combined with sewage, right? So that means that when uh, the sewage and the rainwater combine and flood, that what comes into people's basements is not just water. Okay, and so it is a substantial health problem as well. And so this kind of damage can be common in these areas. So how do we address that? So what we're doing right now and the kinds of edge programming that people want to do is here is, this has some rain on the camera, okay, but we're looking down at a park in Chicago and you can see water beginning to accumulate on the lens, uh, I mean on the, on the grass, and we can then start modeling and doing, making hydrological models which then feed into computation that runs at the edge back to the hydrological models and then predict and say, hey, this is what we need to do to change the, the flow of water or to warn residents. Uh, we recently had someone visiting from Australia, from CSIRO, and they're working on a model uh, to understand and predict fire and flood. Again, an edge computing problem where we have to move parallel computation to the edge. So they are working to deploy some nodes in Melbourne first and then out in the surrounding area where they can take their simulation toolkit, which they already have, they have their own simulation uh, toolkit, take that toolkit and plug it in such that they get edge computed data back into their toolkit and they can forecast where a fire is going to go or where, what kind of uh, uh, areas will be damaged most by the flooding. Uh, we also have a project which uh, is looking to understand ecology and plant and uh, 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 natural settings like prairies. Uh, and uh, one is here at the bottom of this picture is the Chicago Botanical Garden. Chicago Botanical Garden has a green roof and it has some uh, cameras up on the top. And they're looking and trying to study what plants grow under what circumstances and what rate they improve. And to do that, in the past, you would send a grad student out with a digital camera to take pictures of plots, or you might set up a webcam and, and point it down and occasionally take plots, and then a human would look at those images and see what the growth rate is, try to sketch them out, right? But we can see where machine learning and advanced algorithms that can be run in the edge can improve this by example, this uh, automatic segmentation between plants. 
Um, we also have an application recently that uh, uh, um, Adam Szymanski and someone from the Air Force uh, who was visiting Argonne uh, prototyped and is now being tested out at Soldier Field. Soldier Field is a, a place where the Bears uh, play football and uh, around that football stadium is a large parking lot and they obviously uh, would love to know, and there are other in green areas, they would love to know are people flying drones in those areas. And if so, uh, you know, is that the right sort of thing or is there, should they not be doing that? And to do that, we realized that that camera that we had that was facing up could be retasked to look at images and try and determine, is it a bird, is it a plane, or is it a drone? And with the right kind of algorithms, uh, um, Sean Richardson from the Air Force was able to do that. So over here in the top left, uh, we have uh, a fixed wing aircraft, which you can tell both from its uh, trajectory, its very straight trajectory, but also its silhouette. Down here, we have a flock of birds. Uh, the pattern and the silhouette is different. And then, of course, here we have a drone, and you can look at these flight paths and calculate this. So the, these are experiments. They're not production things, but they show the need to do training and processing of HPC images, training data, moving that back out to the edge and doing processing there. We recently signed an agreement with Exelon. Exelon is the country's largest uh, uh, electricity producer, and they have many uh, uh, sub-companies. Uh, ComEd is the company in Chicago area. And they have asked us to integrate these micro PMU units that Berkeley and Livermore have helped uh, work on uh, that measure uh, grid stress or electrical fluctuation very, very precisely. By integrating those into our platform, into Waggle, we can put those things up around a city or around an area and then very precisely understand what's happening with respect to the grid. Is there, are there fluctuations? Is there, uh, are there problems? Uh, is that a squirrel or is it a tree with respect to uh, you know, touching a wire? Uh, and these sorts of d uh, questions, these sorts of issues, the power company needs to be able to compute out on the edge because the data source, the fa how fast that you can sample the electrical grid and look at the harmonics is much faster than you can send all of that data up. An example of that uh, uh, load prediction, again, this, this virtuous circle of HPC linked to the edge is, uh, has been done by Emil. And the, the concept here is something that people call now casting, right? So you take the data from the sensors, you calculate in the future, just a couple hours, you know, maybe five, six hours, what is going to be happening. And with the right, we, well, our hope is that with the right sort of processing, we'll be able to actually calculate exactly when a photovoltaic field or a wind uh, turbine field will start to lose power. Right? And that's very helpful for the, uh, uh, for the electric company to know that. But again, it's a link between simulation and prediction and that computation out at the edge that makes that possible. Um, this is an example of his actual trying this out, uh, getting edge observations uh, and this conceptual test. He's running these uh, predictions out on uh, a machine at Argonne called Bebop. Uh, one or two uh, final uh, examples. Uh, this comes from manufacturing. So uh, there's a facility at Argonne that does sort of test manufacturing uh, capabilities. And there's uh, this uh, a way to generate nanoparticles called flame spray pyrolysis. And uh, uh, most of the instrumentation for that, uh, there are uh, many knobs that need to be turned, right, to make this uh, uh, flame, this combustion work properly. But we need feedback loop so this is an actuator loop. We need feedback loop where we need computation at the edge that's looking at the combustion using infrared and other kinds of cameras, calculating what needs to be done with a learned model and making adjustments to that in real time uh, or in you know, control flow time, right? At the same time, though, you might have simulations running on combustion on the supercomputer and make predictions about what kind of mixes could be changed in that flame spray in order to get the kinds of particles or the kinds of combustion that you want. 
At the, we've been, you know, most of these things I've been talking about here are the IoT world, are in the small things that are, you know, this sort of big, but many of them. But this concept of computing at the edge, physicists have been doing this, as I mentioned, for a long time. But now we are really looking to what is that programming framework that would make that possible. Right? So the light source is a good example of this. This is work that Tech and Bicer at Argonne has done. And the idea that right there at the edge where the light source is generating data, can you do real-time computation on that to then direct the experiment and possibly change the experiment right there in real time. So while we've been working in the science world, the commercial world has not been quiet in this space. Uh, you might be familiar with uh, Amazon Deep Lens. So I think it was more than a year ago now, maybe a year and a half, they said, hey, there's, we're going to put out a developer kit. This is not a product yet. It's a developer kit. And uh, it's a little tiny Linux box. And there's a camera on the top. And uh, you hook it up. And uh, you create this pipeline that I've been talking about of machine learning, training, a model at the edge. And so this is one that's in my uh, office uh, at work. And here is the, you know, the Pete hacking uh, device. And I've loaded up the face detection algorithm that uh, Amazon provides. And you can put that in and then hook that up to a Lambda, which is one of their web service features, that would give you a trigger and ex execute some piece of code every time a face was detected in the room or someone was in the room. So this kind of model commercial companies are beginning to move toward. Of course, Facebook just uh, announced something, a product which sort of tracks, uh, tracks you, no, tracks you where you walk and uh, has the camera looking in your direction. Uh, those kind of doorbells uh, take the same sort of thing. Now, these are visual examples, but really it goes into all of scientific instrumentation where we have devices, software-defined radios, hyperspectral cameras, uh, um, uh, CCDs astronomers use to, uh, to look at imaging, uh, um, the power grid monitoring, all of these devices that have parallel computers out on the edge. And again, it brings us back to this continuum. Um, but really, the thing that, that, from a computer science perspective, that we need to explore is what will be the programming model so are we really going to program these as separate devices? You know, this is IP address such and such. This is IP address such. And I just create a messaging system, and I link the two. Sure, I mean, that's how we're doing it today. But the real issue is this is a linked, coupled system where training happens on the HPC system, and inference happens at the edge, and they're continually upgraded and updated. And so really, a global view of resolution, of, of uh, false positives, of all of those tuning factors really need to be in the programming model. We need to be able to specify that, because this is a coupled unit. And we don't have that sort of uh, global view yet in, uh, in machine learning for these coupled pieces. We have seen, however, and I'm sure you've seen on the show floor, uh, there are a lot of companies making investments in edge devices as well as server devices. So companies like uh, uh, Cerebras and others that you've read about in the news um, are focused on server components. Um, there are other folks like uh, the Movidius uh, device, which is in the bottom uh, left corner of your screen. That's something that uh, Intel bought a company that processes, uh, it has like a 12 or 16 vector cores, and it's for doing inference at the edge. The uh, NVIDIA TX2, uh, we of course have FPGAs that people have been using for years doing signal processing sort of at the edge. And we have these other startups that uh, are not yet released products, you know, Grok, Graphcore, Mythic, and others. Uh, Google just announced an Edge TPU. So this linking of server machine learning and high-performance computing to Edge is really a new space for high-performance computing. It's where we'll be. And the, you know, it's really only the limit of our imagination for how we might use these kinds of devices. We have seen and had discussions with many kinds of people who say, hey, I have an application. An example is we talked to the city of Detroit, and they said, you know, we would love if in our future city we could automatically detect when people who have mobility problems are crossing an intersection and the light is going to turn green before they've crossed the intersection. 
maybe we should uh, adjust the, uh, the traffic signals, right? Or at least stop the cars from moving forward. Uh, automatically detecting when cars or people are falling or sliding in intersections. Um, automatically determining if the right sort of personal protective gear is being worn. Uh, again, an edge computation. Uh, understanding wildlife patterns, edge computation. Uh, the city of Portland asked a very good question. Uh, um, when people use bike share bikes, uh, do they wear helmets? Again, an edge computation which uh, can be done and then the data, the image is thrown away, but it has to be training and pushing that out to the edge. So we have uh, several edgy uh, research challenges. Uh, there's foundations of machine learning. These are math uh, and uh, computer science foundation. Uh, the applied mathematicians love these kind of problems. Uh, how is continuous incremental improvement, that loop that I talked about, going to work? Um, how do we compress data models? Right now, these data models that we, these models that we have on the supercomputer are huge, and shipping them out to the edge you know, all the time is not going to be possible. We're going to need some sort of incremental update uh, method. And of course, the correctness, ac accuracy, and sensitivity. From a programming model perspective, we have this 10 to the ninth, 10 to the ninth link, right? How we take these large machines and connect to small machines and what that programming model looks like. We have goal-based and self-aware programming. These nodes need to have the entire programming system needs to have goals that it's trying to achieve and then turning the right sort of machine programming and machine knobs to make that happen. And finally, this linked uh, HPC forecast uh, with edge observation. From a runtime perspective, I lead uh, a, a group at Argonne. It's an uh, operating systems and runtime team. And uh, we have a project called Argo, uh, the MPI group, uh, other system software at Argonne. And there's a real place for these kinds of advancements and in high performance computing operating systems to make it out to edge operating systems. This kind of goal based scheduling, containers, resource management, all of those pieces we need to manage. So I'll give you one quick example of that. So that drone detection only works when we get about 15 frames a second. If our CPU drops to about 10 or 8 frames a second, things start to fall apart because you can't understand the flight path. You can't get the right sort of movements and curves. Well, those edge devices, other people want to use them for other algorithms, right? Other people might have the camera looking down, might be trying to understand uh, cars sliding in intersections because of ice, might want to understand pedestrians' movement, uh, be looking at something else. Now we have a real-time scheduling resource management problem in the operating system. We have to hit the goal-based, self-aware sort of uh, modeling of how what we can't fall below for the drone detection. We have to match that with uh, uh, with the other computations. And so this kind of scheduling problem is perfect for operating system uh, and system software research in addition to this foundations of machine learning. So if you're interested in this topic, uh, we are having a workshop uh, as part of IPDPS. It's in, uh, it's in a wonderful location in Brazil. Uh, the deadline for submissions is in February. So if you're interested in parallel AI and system software out on the edge, you want to be edgy, Come to Brazil. OK, and with that, uh, I'll wrap up and take questions. So we have microphone stands, so if you have questions, please approach the microphone. And yes, sir. Hi, Pete. Hello. Um, you mentioned strict cybersecurity measures. Can you elaborate a little bit yeah. further in the year of Meldon and Spectre? Yeah, so, um, so uh, one of the decisions that's it's, it's difficult to, for us to work around and it's implement, but it, we, we decided to push early, was that all of the deployed nodes are only able to phone home. So I feel really confident about putting one out and saying, you know, of course, you know, everything can be hacked, right? But I feel pretty confident in putting something out and saying, hey, try and hack it because it doesn't have any, there's no openness, there's no port that's open, there's nothing that you can connect to. It only has one thing it can do and that is phone home a secure server. So that cybersecurity policy, at least in that one vein, uh, is very helpful. Now what it doesn't solve, there are many other problems it doesn't solve. So for example, there have been uh, an interesting paper recently on uh, um, model security. So if you 
are training up all of these images and doing all this machine learning, you boil that all down to a model and you take that model and you move it out to the edge. Well, now if someone hijacks your node physically, they just steal the node, okay, they keep it powered in some way and are able to get access to that model, then they have information about how, what the training set was and what you can detect, well, maybe what you can't detect. What, so there are other, many other cybersecurity problems, but at least that one with respect to how we phone home uh, is, is uh, something we've been working on. How do you measure trust? Uh, I, think it's, I think it's on the dollar bill, uh, trust. Uh, so, um, uh, this is a very difficult problem with respect to um, uh, trust and uh, um, putting nodes out where the public could take one, take it home, modify it, bring it back. Uh, this is an ongoing research area, and we've been looking at lots of solutions for that, but it is a, hard, it is a very hard thing to do. Yes, sir. Yeah, it's a, yeah it's a, my question is kind of close to the trust. So it's just, you are going to collect the data at the edge and then send it to the server to uh, get the model, but there must be some uh, data integrity problem, right? Because the sensor might be faulty and the data you send to the server might not be the correct. Is, uh, is yeah, correct. So uh, we've already you know, found this. Uh, we have about, as I said, about 100 sensors already out in Chicago, and some of them, uh, the data is crazy. Right? I mean, you get, of course, you get nodes where it uh, reports the ozone or the uh, PM 2.5 or something else is just simply wrong. And uh, it takes a lot of work by data scientists to be able to add and find out where they can just calibrate away a problem, right? Because maybe something is a few degrees too hot or a few degrees uh, too moist or something like that, right? And where the data is just incorrect. And that's a data. Uh, problem that uh, uh, people who are stu do statistical uh, analysis are looking at. Hey, Pete. Let's go. Let's, oh, sorry. Uh, gentleman was first. Go ahead, sir. So, are there any problems with data privacy? There's a lot of pictures from public spaces. Uh, at least in Europe, we have a lot of problems doing research on that kind of data. Do you have yeah, so the city of Chicago uh, and the Array of Things project negotiated a very uh, uh, public. A statement and, and process by which uh, new sensors can be added, by which uh, the data can be accessed. Um, it's available actually for public comment. In other words, residents can go and say, hey, I want to talk about this thing. And there have been meetings with aldermen and uh, uh, open mic discussions throughout the neighborhoods. And uh, so uh, photographs or, or images in public spaces, is, is most people are pretty comfortable with that. They're used to that. Uh, of course, where there's a problem are where we look at these kind of machine learning algorithms and what happens with uh, medical imaging, right? So what you would love to do in the future is be able to do an MRI, do a, uh, a cancer screening, do an x-ray, and have the device, the edge device, have the parallel computation right there looking at stuff while also sending training data and images back uh, to a server. So these kinds of problems come up in, in Chicago. It's also something that's been well covered, and we have a pretty good uh, working relationship with the city that makes that possible. And I think we have time for just one more question, sir. Hey, Pete. Uh, I would say uh, your talk is wonderful. Uh, it's one of the best, or in fact, it's the best uh, edge computing talk I have ever heard in the past three years. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> it's really from people from the field. So <laughs> it's much better than the talk I heard from uh, even NVIDIA, Microsoft, Google, and Amazon. <laughs> I'll say it's best. In fact, I, my question We don't know each other, right? I mean, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's right. not one of my employees, is it? All right. <laughs> not your employee, but yeah. Uh, in fact, my question is really about the root. Uh, I think we share about the same concept, but I would rather you to elaborate on the definition of the edge computing we talked here. Because edge computing is so blurring a concept. It's about MEC, about the floor computing, edge cloud, or whatever. But what's your definition? Yeah, um, that's a good question. So um, this term edge computing, you know, we're getting companies coming to us saying, oh, I've heard about edge analytics and, and everybody is, is, it's kind of what happened with grid and what happened with cloud. And, and for, for me, my definition is that we run a real, you know, analysis program and a real parallel program 
in parallel hardware out the edge. If you're just pulling data into the data center and then computing on it, and GE and other companies have been doing that, right, Predix and these other things, they just, they take all of their IoT data, their jet engines, all that, they pull it all into the data center and they compute on it. For me, that's not, that's not really edge computing. It's this notion that I have an independent parallel computer out where the data is being generated, and now I've partnered that with simulation and modeling in the HPC center, right? That, for me, that's, that's what we are interested, but we also, for me, that's sort of the litmus test. So please help me thank Dr. Beckman for the most <laughs> wonderful talk in the last three years on edge computing. <laughs> thank you.